Good to go. All right, thank you. Well, hello out there. I'm Mike Barnett. I serve as Academic Director of the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth session in our inaugural quasi-seminar series. These seminars are designed as debates on important topics related to social innovation. But our aim isn't to convince you that a certain perspective or answer is correct. We're not here to crown winners, as tempting as that may be. Instead, we want to enrich and refine the research questions that scholars use when studying these topics. As editors, reviewers, readers, writers, and teachers of the material underlying these debates, we know all too well that too much of the literature focuses on uninteresting questions that only rehash and rename established ideas. It's our sincere hope that by pointing out what is known on all sides of a debate in very pointed and direct ways that we can drive researchers to produce sharper advances in our understanding of how to help business better serve society. Today, we debate the question, do social movements improve corporate behaviors? Answering in the affirmative is the heart and soul of Stanford, Sarah Soul. Countering in the negative, the man who would be king, it's Brayden King. Corralling all the contingencies, she's the merriest of hunters. We got May McDonald. And finally, moderating this social movement mayhem, everyone's favorite anti-social socialist sociologist, let's hear it for Jerry Davis. Each intern, <laughs> will argue their position. As they do so, please stay muted and post any questions or comments in the chat box. When we get to Jerry, he'll synthesize and extend the arguments as well as offer his own perspective. The open discussion will occur after all four of our presenters have spoken in the half hour or so that will remain thereafter. So let's get the party started. Over to you, Sarah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was uh, desperately, desperately trying to share my screen and unmute at the same time, and I lost, uh, I lost all of you for just a moment. Uh, first of all, I wanted to begin by by thanking Mike for putting this whole series together. I also want to thank him for pronouncing my name correctly. I love that. It never bothers me when people pronounce it incorrectly, but. I, I absolutely love it when people get it correctly. So, and I'm honored to be part of this panel with my good friends uh, and collaborators. And um, I'm really excited to uh, get a chance to chat with you all. So welcome everybody. And I get the, uh, perhaps the, the, the most fun part of our debate today. And that is the uh, question, answering the question of do social movements impact corporate behaviors? And I get the fun part of saying, um, saying essentially yes, and that part is in, in some ways the, the best part of this because as many of you know, much of the research that the, the group of us speaking today has, has focused on this question and in, I, I will go ahead and just sort of say it, I think all of us always want to be able to say, yes, this matters. And I may, maybe I'm speaking out of turn there, but um, I think that that's really uh, kind of at the core of what certainly I have devoted the last uh, 10 or 15 years of research to, to try to show. So with that, I want to begin by thinking about the impact of social movements on firms. And I want to talk about the way in which um, social movements impact firm, um, firms. I'm going to give you a bunch of citations that you can uh, dig into and look at as you go forward in your study of this question. And I want to begin with one way that this happens, and that is thinking about what the literature and others have referred to as concrete concessions. And, and what this essentially means is that social movements have real effects on policy changes of firms, on thinking about routines within the firms and thinking about the way in which um, resources are distributed within firms and these kinds of questions. Some of the core examples might be looking at uh, again, for example, the effect of protest on firm divestment in various controversial issues. And we've seen several papers that have shown that there is a, a, at least a correlation between protest and divestment in controversial um, of, of firms engaged in controversial kinds of activities. So for example, foreign direct investment in Myanmar, 
or um, thinking about uh, historically, thinking about um, divestment in firms that uh, have um, have interests in South Africa during the apartheid area, area and so on. We can also think about the literature, the vast literature, thinking about policies such as um, same-sex marriage or domestic partnership kinds of issues within firms. Uh, several papers over the years have linked employee activism to um, the promotion of uh, promotion and passage of these kinds of um, policies that are favorable for to LGBTQ plus communities within the firms and so on. So concrete concessions, lots of evidence of um, ways in which protest and social movement activism has impacted these kinds of uh, activities. Then we can also think a lot about symbolic kinds of concessions. And this is something that some of you know that Braden and May and Braden May and I have worked on. And so for example, one of the ways in which we've conceptualized symbolic kinds of concessions are thinking about the way in which shareholder resolutions are associated with the um, implementation of CSR committees and CSR reports and thinking about the way in which um, firms respond with these largely symbolic kinds of gestures or symbolic kinds of concessions, which we hope may lead to um, further kinds of concrete concessions down the road. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And then finally, I'm kind of adding another category here, which are symbolic gestures. Now, some of the work, for example, that May has done uh, has looked at the way in which um, protest may lead to gestures such as thinking about you know, pro-social kinds of statements. But we can also think about this, you know, as we think about this past year, when we think about the rise in uh, protests associated with the Black, Black Lives Matter movement that uh, you know, one of the things that many of us have been very interested in is thinking about the way in which uh, the vast majority of Fortune 500 companies issued uh, statements that are, um, you know, in, in support of Black Lives Matter. The question, of course, then becomes, are there any resources behind some of these statements and so on? So that's another way to think about this. And then, you know, sort of finally, I'll also mention a working paper by one of my students here, uh, at Stanford, which is looking at, and this is also related to the Black Lives Matter movement and um, these kinds of symbolic gestures on the parts of firms, looking at the way in which um, some kinds of protests are associated with firms using their foundations, their corporate foundations, to make some kind of a gesture or donation to a particular movement. Famously, in 2015, Google um, made a very, very substantial donation to Black Lives matter. But when we look at uh, some of the data from 2020 in particular in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, we see that there were many firms that used their foundations to try to promise um, resources to Black Lives Matter or to other kinds of um, associations and organizations that are engaged in eliminating or reducing systemic racism and racial inequality. So when we think about the impact of, of firms on movements, one way to, uh, of movements on firms is to think about you know, the ways in which this can happen from concrete kinds of concessions to the more symbolic uh, concessions and symbolic gestures which may happen. Uh, and when, but, but I think one of the things that we need to also point out when we think about this is the kind of mechanisms for why we expect this to happen. And one of the primary mechanisms that we can think about in terms of, so why might firms respond to social activism is to think about the direct threat to their financial performance. And there's a lot of research that looks at such um, uh, kinds of metrics as sales, profits, negative abnormal stock price returns. We can also think about the way in which, um, I, I don't have a citation on this, uh, on this particular page for you to engage with, but we can also think about ways in which sabotage and, um, and the way in which uh, riots and other kinds of activity may stop business, normal business operating um, uh, operations for some period of time because of the disruption to normal business and so on as well. So it's another way to look at this. But there's a lot of literature that points to the um, way in which 
the kinds of um, financial metrics that we might look to in terms of wondering how this might, how, how, how protest and boycotts and shareholder resolutions may matter, and, and finds that there's some fairly substantial evidence using fairly sophisticated modeling techniques that we borrow from um, our colleagues in finance and accounting and so on to show that, yeah, actually there, there is a direct financial um, hit often to firms that are being protested for various kinds of activities. I'll sort of say that I think possibly the first paper to, to bring this up was one that came out of um, Braden's work and, and uh, some of the ideas that he had when he was uh, still, still a graduate student and um, one of the first papers as a, an assistant professor that he wrote that I'm honored to be part of was one of the first to actually think about at least the abnormal stock price return and that's been followed by um, a number of other scholars. So, but we also can think about the indirect kinds of threats that social movements may have on firms with respect to thinking about ratings, reputation and image. I'm not going to say much about this because Braden is going to talk more about this in his remarks, but I want to just sort of draw your attention to a couple of ways in which this works. So for, you know, for example, one of the things that some research has shown is that um, protests directed in particular in, in the, uh, uh, to apparel industry firms is associated with them getting a concern rating by KLD. And this is important because concern ratings um, by KLD have been linked to um, subsequent financial performance. More directly, we can think about some work by, um, by Braden and one of his colleagues looking at protest boycotts and shareholder resolution. So various kinds of tactics and these leading to these increased um, perceived risk of firms, which are then connected to a drop in the market value of a firm. So there's this way in which there's this indirect effect too connected to, as I said before, the financial um, performance of firms. I'll stop there on the indirect and the, then these because I think uh, Braden's going to say more about that. I wanted to also talk about, so, you know, I've been thinking about the mechanisms by which we might expect firms, uh, protests to have effects on firms. I think it's also important to think about some of the other factors that are important to consider as we think about studies that we might want to conduct that will um, will examine questions of how protest matters to firms and how social activism matters to firms. And the first of these has to do with tactical choice. And this is something that I think some people have spent some time looking at, but in various kinds of ways. So for example, some people look at um, playing off the effect of protest versus shareholder resolutions versus boycotts. But then others have dug even deeper into thinking about tactical choices. And one of my favorite pieces on this was um, published by Forrest Briscoe and colleagues in 2015 in ASQ. And this was um, with respect to a paper on the Rain in Russell campaign on campuses. And the finding in this paper, the thing that caught my attention and has captured my imagination is that there's certain kinds of tactics that were used on certain campuses, which built empathy with, um, with sweatshop workers in developing countries. And they essentially brought workers to campuses to tell the story of what it's like to work in a sweatshop um, condition. And the, the finding in the paper is that when this particular tactical was, tactic was used, um, or uh, the, the universities were much more likely to sever their contacts with, in this case, Russell Athletics. So this, this idea of, um, of, of taking the perspective of somebody who is impacted by various um, kinds of um, firm, firm practices, shall we say. So that's just a, an example of a tactical choice beyond just kind of thinking about let's play off boycotts versus protests versus shareholder resolutions and so on. Another sort of set of considerations that I think are really important and increasingly showing up in a lot of our research on this topic is thinking about the strategic choice of targets. So what targets, what firms are more likely than others to be chosen by various kinds of activist uh, organizations? And a few things to think about is first, visibility. Um, to what extent do social movements choose the more visible ta targets, the name brand targets, consumer facing um, firms, for example. So that's one piece of it. 
Another uh, is about hypocrisy and some of the work that May has done recently has looked at hypocrisy and others have looked at hypocrisy. I have a student right now who is doing a bunch of experiments building on some of the work that Braden and others have done, looking at how, um, how audiences respond to um, suggestions of hypocrisy on the part of firms and it's as you might expect but I think at an experimental level and then finally receptivity a lot of folks have begun to look at um, uh, uh, thinking broadly about the corporate opportunity structure and how that may make certain firms more likely than others to be targeted and getting very sophisticated at what corporate opportunity structure is. Corporate opportunity structure, as many of you know, was something that, that Braden introduced as kind of a build on the um, sociological and social movement scholars idea of political opportunity structure. And so, you know, folks look at things Things like CEO turnover, board turnover, various ways that we may see an openness in the firm to the suggestions of, um, of social movements and, uh, and, and protests. But others, and May has done some of this work, but certainly Forrest Briscoe and others have been looking at CEO ideology and how that might be a measure of um, receptivity to the um, to the claims of a social movement um, organization. So thinking about how there's a, a match, if you will, and, and whether or not a board or a CEO or leadership team is um, receptive to the claims and believes in the claims of the social movement um, um, organization or, or activists that are targeting them. So thinking about how these sorts of factors matter to uh, the, the way in which protest and activism impacts, in, impacts firms is important. And then finally, I'll say the framing of the grievances. Um, for those of you who know the, the literature on social movement framing, it's, um, it, it you know, essentially is looking at the way in which activists are, are um, able or more or less able to make the claims um, resonate with those in who, who they're trying to get to join the movement. And so there's been a lot of work on thinking about what does it matter if we frame this as the business case for, for um, businesses, or should we frame this as in, in sort of terms of more moral reasons why this particular um, uh, issue is important to firms to consider. So thinking about the framing. And then finally, I wanted to just kind of conclude with a few thoughts about where I think we ought to be moving and questions we ought to be asking um, as we move forward with this literature. And I'll begin with one, which is thinking about the influence of, um, of outsider activism on insider processes. So in this literature, as, as you probably know, there are some people who study outsider activism, people who don't have a deep connection to the firm. And, and we can also think about these as kind of on a continuum to people who are employees of, um, of, of a firm or an organization. But thinking about the interplay between insider and outsiders is one, um, I think, ripe area for research. Um, I, we published a paper a couple of years ago now on what we referred to as osmotic mobilization, which looked at the way in which union organizing, in particular within firms, was impacted by protest outside of the firms. That's one example of this. But I think we can think about it, and again, I keep going back to thinking about the Black uh, Lives Matter movement of 2020 in particular, and thinking about the way in which um, very much what was happening outside of firms in this country and other countries dramatically impacted what was going on inside firms with many employee activists, Google is one that keeps coming uh, to mind here in Silicon Valley, um, began to mobilize around issues related to systemic racism and racial injustice within their firms, very much inspired by the signaling of what was going on in the broader um, broader U.S., but certainly global movement related to, to BLM. So that's what, you know, kind of a contemporary example of that. And then another way that we may see this happening, and, and this comes out in some of um, May's current work, is thinking about collaborations and coalitions across boundaries. So to what extent are employee activists actively engaging with um, um, activists outside of the firm through um, collaboration with NGOs in the case of some of May's more recent work and some other work that other folks have done, or um, you know, thinking about uh, the way in which we as human beings within our firms 
uh, often the, uh, also um, are members of social movements outside the firm. So we have this you know, way of thinking about uh, that, way, that connection as well. And then finally, I'll just sort of say something that may sound kind of retro, but I think it's really important for us to think about, and, and Braden's going to say more about this as well, is thinking about how, you know, you know like in, in my book, you know, from 2009, one of the things that I argue is we need to think about social movements impacting firms directly, but we also need to think about the way in which, let's not forget that social movements can impact um, the uh, governmental apparatus around regulation in particular. And that's something that I, I think we need to come back to and do more on, because as Braden's going to talk a little bit about, you know, one-off, uh, one-off, um, targeting of social movements of firms is, of course, super important, but we also need to think about broader systemic change and the role of the government apparatus in this. And I know that may sound a little bit retro, but I think it's time for us as, um, as scholars of social movements um, to come back to some of those insights and work more on that. So with that, I hope I didn't go too much over and I will uh, pass the mic. I'm Mike. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's uh, some great insights. And it's going to be very interesting because, you know, you're arguing that social movements do improve corporate behavior. Uh, and then you're citing one guy in particular quite a lot, Braden King. And so now he's going to tell us the opposite of that. Uh, Braden, you're up. Thanks, Mike, for putting me in the odd position of uh, arguing against myself and, and my co-authors today. But um, I'm actually glad you did this because it forced me to kind of think through kind of, the, you know, what are the, 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 the long-term big consequences of social movements? And I think if you asked activists themselves, like, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, most of them, you know, would, would say, you know, we are trying to create change in society. We're trying to change the world. Um, we think of social movements, we often think of sort of these iconic moments where activists um, were engaged with, you know, a particular tactic against a particular organization, whether it be the state or, you know, it, going, you know, all the way through history, you can see activists that were targeting businesses as well. So one of the pictures here is of the civil rights activists who are targeting um, the uh, Woolworths and, and doing sit-ins and, boy and boycotts of that business. But if you ask them, you know, do you, are you just trying to get Wool Woolworths to change or are you trying to get the world to change? They would clearly say, you know, we want um, the entire, so in our society to be desegregated and to embrace equality. I think the same is true of environmental activists today where they would say, yeah, we want Exxon to change but really our goal is to change the world and hopefully prevent uh, catastrophe, uh, <laughs> world destruction is, is actually what they're, uh, they're trying to prevent that from happening. So I'm gonna argue that when you look at it in that way, um, can do social movements improve corporate behaviors? The answer is no, like they're not as effective as we would like to think they are. I'm not gonna go through all this research. Sarah did a really good job of pointing out that there is a lot of uh, research that indicates that movements can have an effect on companies uh, when they're engaging them one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the primary reasons that companies respond to activists is because they worry about the, the reputational damage that activists uh, create for them. So activists, by bringing new information to bear on a, on a company's behavior or simply drawing attention to the bad behavior of that company, end up changing perceptions, whether it be those of investors or employees or other stakeholders, including government regulators. regulators, And those that change in perception is a real reputational threat against those companies. And so many of many firm re, firms' reactions to activists is a basically a response to their desire to, you know, uh, to prevent that reputational damage from spreading. And as organizational scholars, we know that there is this tension between um, organizations that are trying to respond to kind of a surface level reputational problem uh, versus, you know, implementing, you know, solutions to that problem inside their organizations. And I think that, you know, activists are constantly kind of uh, dealing with this tension themselves. On the one hand, they do want companies to respond to their, uh, respond to their, their demands by making policy changes, but they don't want those policy changes to be merely symbolic and to be merely surface level. Um, and we know from a, a lot of research that, in fact, over the, the history of activist um, influence with corporations, um, much of this change has been sort of surface level. I'm thinking in particular of the work on civil rights legislation 
and um, you know, um, diversity, um, the, the, the subsequent uh, for efforts to implement diversity training within uh, corporations. Lori Edelman, Frank Dobbin, and others have shown that much of that was quite, quite weak and actually affecting what companies did, uh, despite it looking like a victory um, from the activist perspective. And then if you go to the world of environmental activists, clearly a lot of companies are trying to you know, look like they care about the environment, uh, but what, what are they actually doing to make that change happen? Like, what are they doing to make the world a more environmentally friendly place? So we have lots of terms for this in, you know, in, the, in the real world that we live in. You know, woke washing is a new one apparently, but greenwashing is something that we've been aware of for a while. Uh, Tom Lyon has done a lot of research on this as well. So I think you know, it's worth it to sort of ask these questions from the activist perspective. Activists care about big problems, big systemic problems like climate change, like uh, ridding the world of racial uh, gender discrimination. Those are just examples, but we can all agree that those are problems that don't just exist in one company, but they exist in society and companies are the platforms that activists use to try to trigger a broader societal change. But if the problems are systemic, like environmental uh, destruction is, then the solutions also need to be systemic. And the problem for activists and for firms is that firms are you know, competitively designed to differentiate and to try to you know, do things to, that allow them to uh, make a profit as well. And that leads to scattered implementation of activist demands. Some firms do better jobs than others. And in fact, most of the research that we have been doing is to sort of exploit that uh, between firm heterogeneity to look at variation in firms' actions, when what activists really need is uniformity in, in, in firms' actions um, in, the, in the direction that they, that they desire. And so that leads to kind of a third problem, which is that really to solve these systemic problems, uh, companies need to themselves engage in collective action. They, they can't do what we see a lot of happening in, the, in, in industries, which is a race to the bottom, um, where you know they're, 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 they all are sort of competing to see who can do this the, the most profitably. Um, and the question I have for companies is what incentives are we offering them or do they have to cooperate with each other to really address the systemic problems that are at the root of, of, of the activist concerns. And then add on top of that, that NGOs um, or a lot of social movement organizations um, don't have a lot of capabilities to monitor. Um, I, I talk about this all the time when, when I'm discussing the question with activists is like, what are you well designed? What, are, what is your organization well designed to do? Many of them are very well designed to create reputational threats for the against companies. Um, they're almost like little PR machines. Um, they can mobilize people, get them out there, create media havoc for companies, but they're not always well designed to interface with organizations and to go in and to monitor them and to enforce the norms that they're trying to create. Tim Bartley has done an excellent job of showing how this is a problem. Um, when you look at the supply chain of companies, um, and many of which have you know, committed to doing things like, you know, we're against deforestation or we're in favor of, of human, human rights uh, standards in our, in, our, in our supply chain. But when you go down and look at it, their, their suppliers are, are still shirking and not doing a good job. And it's primarily because the activists don't have the ability to monitor them all the time. And that's the issue that many transnational certification systems have, which on the surface are kind of collective agreements between activists uh, the industry, and the industry partners to create norms that can, that can be enforced. Um, but we know from looking at those certification systems that they just give many companies the ability to say that they're doing something even though there's a lot of poor implementation at the ground level. And then activists themselves are not well coordinated. If you look at the environmental movement, there are a ton of environmental movement organizations and they're not all on the same page. So what is the hope for, for movements? If we really wanna change the world, if activists really wanna change the world, you know, what, what needs to be done? You know, I think there's an argument to be made that what social movements are good at, like what they're, like what they're actually doing now is leading incremental change. And the, the way that they do that is by shaping the agenda, it, you know, they partly through these reputational threats that they create against companies, they're shaping what firms consider to be worthy of discussion as they, as they set their strategy and such. Uh, so now we can say that, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion are a legitimate issue that we should consider at any, at any corporation. 
it's hard to imagine you would have gotten there if you wouldn't have had activists pushing for that. So yes, activists are certainly gonna shape the agenda, but how do you get from agenda uh, to implementation? I think that's the bigger question here. So movements need the power of a third party, um, particularly because they don't have the ability to monitor very well and they don't have the ability to enforce. And so we need to go back to a model where the state is involved. And that's not just a research question, it's also a practical question. I don't have the answer for it, unfortunately. But how do you get a large you know, government, you know, intergovernmental organization involved that could actually monitor and enforce what companies are doing at the ground level, especially on these environmental issues? And then the third thing I think that where there's hope is that you know, at, you know, activating these insiders that Sarah talked about. I think of them as the allies. And in fact, if you go back to the old social movement literature, they, des they describe them as movement allies, people who are working inside institutions um, and their, their views or goals are aligned with those of the activists. They're not necessarily part of the activist world, but they align with them in terms of their objectives. And having those key allies on board could be the, the main way through which meaningful change could take place. So that goes to my last slide, which is, you know, uh, what's next on the research agenda? Uh, so for young scholars, what should you be focusing on? Well, one question I think that's interesting is, you know, under what conditions do activist agendas become implementable or implemented in, through organizational practices? We need to study more this pathway between agenda setting and implementation. I know some scholars are already doing this. Grace Augustine, who I think is here, uh, is, do, is doing this in some of her research. Uh, Donald Quilly um, at LBS has also looked at this quite a bit, but more needs to be done on the implementation side. Uh, the second question I would ask is, you know, what can activists do to make weak states strong, uh, and the, uh, sort of playing on words here, there's a lot of research about the benefits of the weak state, weak state, but in the world we live in now where governments are not as powerful as they used to be, is there something that activists can do to reinvigorate their role in regulating uh, companies, especially on these big societal problems that are systemic? And the last question I would ask is, how do social movements convert employees to become allies. So you, you, don't, you don't want just them to be sympathetic people, like there are lots of people who sit on the sidelines who are sympathetic to movement's goals. I think what activists really need is to convert these employees to becoming champions of their causes within organizations. And, and that would have a real impact potentially on transforming organizational practices for good. All right, I'll stop there and then pass the baton on to May. Hey, thanks very much, Braden. Um, so, you know, we've got to ask ourselves now, is Braden right or is Braden right? And so uh, pointing out the contingencies then uh, that uh, <laughs> on what that depends uh, is May. Thank you very much. May, also known as little baby Braden. So we'll see if big Braden or baby Braden is more right. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, I have plenty of, of negative things to say about a Zoom, but I think this is the first time I've ever been simultaneously in the same space with Sarah and Jerry and Brayden, and that's pretty magical to me. So I'll, I'll, I'll give Zoom kudos for that, and thank you, Mike, for putting this together. I think I'll always remember. So I'm in the uh, enviable, enviable position as a, as a trained lawyer of arguing the maybe position, which is, of course, what I'll be most comfortable doing. Um, I wanted to start by, you know, asking if we should rephrase this question a little bit, because I don't think that we are all interested in whether social movements improve corporate behavior as an absolute matter. But I think what we're more interested in is the counterfactual. Are social movements producing a world where corporations are acting better than they would in a world in which we use something else, right? Is the, are social movements the best avenue we have? for producing a, a socially responsible corporate field. So I'm gonna kind of gear my uh, thoughts toward that. And I just added this slide this morning because I, I couldn't sleep last night thinking about a conversation I had with my corporate governance students. Um, where I've noticed just over the years teaching corporate governance that my students are completely willing to write off regulation as a viable possible solution to corporate problems entirely. They've just given up on it. And so it's kind of going back to what Sarah said was the, the retro argument, but, but I think we've given up on the regulatory apparatus too quickly. Um, so, you know, in part, the reason that we see an increase in corporate targeted activism is because of widespread disenchantment with public politics. 
you know, politics is clunky. It takes forever. It, it hurts. It's painful. And political, the political field right now, at least in America, is seen as largely captured by corporations. So it doesn't seem like it would be an easy way to actually solve um, corporate problems, to make corporate behavior better. That said, in an ideal world behind, you know, the veil of ignorance, if we were designing the best system, a working regulatory system would probably be preferable to creating field level um, reforms than depending on private politics. And I feel like, Jerry, I have this recollection of reading you making this argument in kind of an informal outlet. And it, it, it made a really powerful um, impression on me, but I can't remember exactly where it was. So if, if you remember, then maybe you could, could uh, let us know when you chime in. So I think the key question we need to I'd be asking is how does private politics affect the likelihood of formal regulation? And there's two arguments. So in the field, when I talk to NGO people, especially, they'll often say that, you know, today, given the real politics that we are presented with, um, uh, private politics engaging firms directly is necessary because it's necessary to have corporate champions on board in order to achieve policy solutions. So you're not kind of being counter lobbied by the entire corporate field when you're pressing for a policy solution. Uh, that said, you know, I fear that the ease of engaging in uh, corporate targeted activism today may make it less likely that people will have the energy to, to mobilize in formal politics and the patience. You know, the worry is you can feel like you express your voice just by sharing an article about a boycott or posting something on a firm's um, a Facebook page. And so it gives you an outlet for kind of your rage in a way that makes it less likely you'll actually um, muster it to mobilize and, and engage in more um, a serious political campaign. And so I do worry that kind of slacktivism will undermine the ability of the public to mobilize and press for, for a formal political solutions. There's also the worry that, you know, at the end of the day, when social movements garner a direct concession from a company, what they have negotiated is an informal regulatory solution, right? So the it, it, social movements in this way are acting as an informal regulator. And the worry is that, you know, as, as Tom Lyon has excellent work showing, firms are going to be more willing to do this when they see it as a way to preempt more costly political intervention. And so where we see firms conceding most readily may actually be where we would otherwise have the most promise of regulation. And so I think you know, private politics can in that way potentially undermine the viability of, of public regulatory solutions. Um, so anyway, the, the point of this is thinking about how a regulatory system may be preferable if what we're concerned about is broader field level change, like, like Braden. I said, and you know, the worry here is that movements don't seem to be that great at producing broad field level change. Um, and you know, I don't want to just repeat the arguments that Braden was making, but to to add on to them, uh, our research on social movement activism tends to focus on the, the politics of contention, contentious tactics like boycotts and protests. Uh, but that Briska Gupta and Anna piece that Sarah pointed you to finds that when you think about the likelihood that a concession is going to provoke um, broader field level adoption of a reform, uh, con concessions that are won from contentious politics are less likely to do that than concessions that are won from collaboration or, um, uh, or uh, you know, convincing firms that's the right thing to do. And the reason is that people, other actors in the field, look at a firm's concession for a signal about whether it is objectively the rational thing to do. And if they were, if the, if the activists forced their hand, then the field doesn't see it as necessarily a, um, a, a rational uh, move. It's, it was a forced move. Whereas if the firm is convinced in a more kind of um, amiable way, then the field sees the concession as a signal that there might, there might actually be a, a bottom line driven a reason for engaging in this uh, reform. And so it's more likely to disseminate. So what it suggests is that SMOs may be more effective at creating field level reform if they're using collaborative tactics. Um, and that's 
not a, a, a bad thing because we are finding that SMOs are increasingly using collaborative tactics. So they, they do seem to be uh, onto this and uh, are, are appearing to be more, um, more effective and willing to engage firms uh, collaboratively. Um, so I have a paper that just came out in org science about this, but I want to point you to, to Kate Odzimkowska's dissertation, which is really setting the groundwork for a sophisticated way to study uh, collaboration between firms and activists. And so look for papers from this dissertation coming out uh, in prominent journals near you, hopefully in the near future. So collaborating may be better for fostering fieldwide reform, but it's necessarily riskier to SMOs. And so this is one reason why SMOs are a little bit, social movement organizations are a little bit less willing to engage in their collaborative uh, repertoire. And just to show you that in this org science paper, um, we studied what happened to social movement organizations around the BP oil spill. And we found that movement organizations that had contentiously targeted the oil and gas industry before the spill uh, enjoyed an increase in contributions after the spill. But social movement organizations that had collaborated with oil and gas industry before the spill suffered from a decline in contributions. And so the reputational damage from the spill spills over and affects uh, the social movement organization's performance and reputations. And because of that, um, corporate uh, industry scandals can can create a widespread chilling effect on social movements' willingness to use their collaborative repertoire. Just to show you this from uh, that org side paper. So this graph is showing you across a, a random selection of all firms looking at social movement organizations, uh, collaborative and contentious engagements over time, what happened around the BP oil spill. And what you see is that movements were progressively engaging in more and more and more collaboration. And then right after the, the oil spill, that collaboration just completely fell off. So it scared movements and, and they, you know, the, the reputational risk that they run and collaborating became really salient around the scandal. So while the collaborative repertoire could be really useful for producing field level um, change, the challenge there is that movement's willingness to collaborate requires a baseline amount of trust. And that trust is really easily broken in the corporate field. Uh, and for movements to be willing to engage this collaborative repertoire, they have to have a fair appetite for risk. And so that's you know, something that movements as all organizations are probably having trouble grappling with. Okay, so the, the last point I'll make is another one that has been um, echoing from prior points, but you know, what, whether social movements are resulting in an improvement in corporate social responsibility depends on your definition of corporate social responsibility. And the important thing is that I think that the polarized world that we live in is, you know, underlining how the, even the, the baseline idea of corporate social responsibility is subjective, right? Activism is problematizing corporate values or practices. But the issues that activists are contesting are politically contested issues. And so you're gonna get a divide on, you know, around ideological fault lines about what the right corporate responsible uh, thing to do is. And so different movements may be, um, may be mobilizing to press for more conservative corporate behavior or more progressive corporate behavior and may come to very different conclusions about what it would be appropriate for firms to do. So just to show you this, you know, when you're looking at the uh, LGBTQ movement, which is one of the prominent movements of our time, of course, um, there's evidence of movements mounting to attack firms at either side of the political spectrum. So Disney was boycotted in 1995 when it extended health benefits to the partners of its gay employees by conservative movements who thought that was the wrong thing to do. While United Airlines was targeted in 1997 for not offering those same benefits by progressive activists who thought that they ought to um, uh, extend those benefits. And so, you know, there's a, a, a broader ideological contest happening about what corporate social responsibility looks like. Um, and importantly, liberals and conservatives are unlikely to agree, to agree about what counts as an improvement in corporate social responsibility. So this is a, a uh, you know, grappling with this ideological, um, the, ideolo the, the politics of ideology that are kind of under um, modern social movements is a, a, a 
current obsession of mine. And I have this uh, working paper with Samantha Darnell, my wonderful graduate student who's here, I believe with us, uh, trying to kind of explore this in more detail. And so first I'll show you just over time, something that should be a little bit chilling to uh, all of us to the extent that most of us are progressive. So this graph is showing you over time the total number of progressive boycotts in the US by election cycle. And so what you see is a decline in progressive oriented anti-corporate activism over time. Uh, at the same time, this is the total number of anti-corporate activist challenges that are conservative oriented. And what you see is that an increase in the amount of anti-corporate activism that is conservative over time, particularly after the Trump administration took over. And so, you know, what it suggests is that the, the market share of activism that is conservative is increasing and the share of it that is progressive is decreasing. And I think that's something that we need to really try to figure out and get our hands around why this is happening and what it means about how social movements affect firms. Um, we also find it's really important because whether or not firms will concede to a given challenge depends on the ideological orientation of their key stakeholders. So to show you this in the same data on boycotts, we find that after liberal um, boycotts, Firms with more liberal leaning employees are more likely to concede than those with conservative employees and vice versa after conservative boycotts. And the same is true after, uh, when, depending on firms, um, the ideological orientation of their local governments. So after liberal leaning boycotts, firms that have more liberal leaning local governments are more likely to concede as compared to those with more conservative leaning local governments. And so we have to kind of try to unpack the ideological orientation of firms the key stakeholders who are pressuring firms to take actions within them, and the ideological variation in activism itself in order to understand how exactly activism is likely to shape corporate practices going forward. So just a couple of future research questions that I think are prompted by these comments. Um, the first is thinking again about the tactical repertoire in more detail. Instead of you know, trying to explore whether tactics matter, which is most of us have been doing uh, historically, I think we need to move now to think about what strategies work, what, what combination of tactics and in what uh, areas of the field uh, help to maximize field level reform. Um, and echoing what Sarah said, a big part of this is thinking about how movements select their targets but including both public sector targets and private sector targets. So a more kind of um, uh, uh, complex strategic um, repertoire. So also what companies make the safest and most effective partners for collaboration? If collaboration is, is a key part of actually shaping the corporate social responsibility in a, a meaningful field level way, I think we need to learn more about you know, how to make companies the kind of actors that social movements are comfortable collaborating with and how social movements can protect themselves when they use the collaborative repertoire. Uh, and finally, thinking about how movement outcomes are affected by increasing political polarization and the increasing prevalence of conservative activism itself. That is all from me, I will stop here. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so it depends on a whole lot. It's very complicated. So now we leave it to Jerry for the minor task of just bringing it on home. Complete, complete synthesis and a clarity uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you. I'm hoping to be the Timothy Davini of this session because that guy has that capacity to do that. You ever look at your slides right before you go on Zoom and say, there's no such thing as screenshot, is there? <laughs> Okay, um, so I, uh, Sarah said that activists can shape corporate behavior for the better. She gave lots of examples of that. Uh, May said uh, their success depends on how the activism is implemented, and it also depends on what you mean by good. Uh, and Braden says the problems are systemic, uh, that firms alone can't solve them, that in some sense we got to go back to the states if we really want to see uh, some kind of uh, serious social change. It can't be done at just the firm level. Um, I want to say actually something morose and nihilistic, which is no one can know the truth uh, in answer to this question. So a little bit of context. 
why is there so much attention to social movements now? Back in the day, back when I was your age or when I was May's age, nobody was studying social movements and organizations. Uh, it was an oddball topic and kind of heretical, and now it seems to be everywhere. And I want to give some context on why there's more attention to it now. So boycotts have been around forever. Uh, us old people remember the Nestle boycott in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, they're working a lot faster now than they used to. So it's almost exactly three years since the Parkland uh, school massacre. Within a few days of that, uh, of, of that shooting, a website put up by Think Progress said, hey, here's three dozen companies that are doing business with the NRA. Maybe we should boycott them. Within 48 hours of this being posted, two dozen of these companies cut their ties with the National Rifle Association. One of them was Delta Airlines. They said, we used to give discounts to NRA members. Uh, no more. The Georgia State Legislature, which was considering a big tax break for Delta, said, hold on there, Delta. If you do this, if you don't restore that benefit, we're going to uh, take away the tax cut we promised you. And Delta said, do your worst. We're not changing. Super interesting. So they can act, act much faster uh, than they used to or they can be much, much slower than they used to. So there was a chocolate boycott uh, over 20 years ago against Hershey, Nestle, and Mars. They said, all right, we promise to stop using slave labor within your lifetimes. Uh, turns out they have not done so. To this day, 20 years later, they're still using child labor uh, in Cote d'Ivoire to provide them with the cacao. So sometimes social movements can be slow, or sometimes they can backfire spectacularly, as when uh, Nike used Colin Kaepernick as the spokesperson uh, for their ad campaign. Uh, you may recall this a couple of years ago, uh, white people said, how dare Nike uh, promote someone who believes black people deserve dignity, or I don't know what their argument against him was, whatever it might've been though. It turns out that uh, the kind of people uh, that listen to Rush Limbaugh buy their sneakers at Target for $30. The kind of people that love Colin Kaepernick buy their sneakers from uh, StockX for $300. And so the effect of the boycott uh, by the anti-Kaepernick gang uh, actually completely backfired and ended up having a good effect. So clearly there's a, a lot of complication in how we think about whether social movements improve or change uh, corporate behaviors. I wanna point out though that uh, boycotts are everywhere now. You can start a boycott right now from your phone, maybe of my employer at the University of Michigan based on my talk, but boycott.com allows you to scan the product SKUs in stores and it will tell you what boycotts are currently being called against those enterprises. So you can walk through the, uh, your Piggly Wiggly and figure out what's being boycotted and what is not. And if you go to their website, what you will discover is that every corporation in America is being boycotted right now. Monsanto, uh, companies that do business in Israel, animal testers, Coke Industries. There's Nestle again on the lower right. They're basically the, the, uh, the permanent boycott uh, against Nestle. Every company is being boycotted at some level. That is a methodological problem for those that wanna study whether or not boycotts work. And it turns out that it doesn't end even when the CEO retires and moves to, uh, to his or her great reward. The CEO of Home Depot uh, is objectionable to many people. People are boycotting Home Depot because of what a retiree does. So much like Delta is besmirched by doing business with the NRA, Home Depot is besmirched because of their former CEO. So it's really complicated. I wanna make a, a methodological point. <laughs> so, we're living in an age saturated in social media, political polarization. So politics and social movements are gonna be inescapable for the corporate sector. Outside politics, inside politics, led by their own employees. Companies cannot escape politics these days. Uh, you can be boycotted for any number of things. I wanna make a, a methodological point about this entire line of research, which I myself have, uh, have uh, interacted with. So, uh, the question that Mike posed to us was, do social movements improve corporate behavior? And we've looked at things like uh, social movements are led by declines in stock prices or improvements in sales or whatever. Um, this question, as it's asked, calls for a drug study, something along the lines of, does hydroxychloroquine reduce mortality from COVID? So a drug test, and you could imagine objective scientists doing double blind assignment to treatments and some companies get a real social movement 
and some get a placebo social movement. And then a couple of years later, you open the envelopes and see which one is improved and see whether social movements or placebos uh, made an effect. That's what we would like to see. The problem is that what we have is epidemiological data. We have naturally occurring data and social movements being pervasive at all levels from employees to the national level and international level. It's kind of like asking the question, does exposure to plastics affect human health? How would you study the question of whether exposure to plastics uh, influences human health? It is effectively impossible. Are you gonna raise twins, one in a plastic-free island in the South Pacific and one without? There's just no practical way uh, to study that. And re that raises a whole lot of problems for the kind of research that we would like to do around social movements. We live in a world where journal publication practices demand regressions with dependent and independent variables. Um, they, will, they will use the Wharton Research Data Services where ideally something that fits into R or Stata in an XT format. And you say in year zero, this thing happened. And then in year one, we saw this impact on the company's board of directors or financial performance or divestitures or whatever it is that we're looking at. That's the way we love to study things uh, is with time series data that can be done in a fixed effects model uh, to get into ASQ. Um, there's a problem though, when studying social movements in the format that our journals like to see. Um, and it's gonna be alliterative because I teach in a business school. So the first one is about the treatment population. Why did these patients end up being in the sample? And at some level, you could say I did one regression to see who got selected for the boycott or the shareholder resolution or blah, 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 and then throw in some, some variable for susceptibility to being targeted and then look at the outcome. But how do we even know who got the treatment and who did not? Um, I study employee activism and social entrepreneurship. We know the ones that worked. We don't know the ones that didn't work. We have very weak data on efforts by employees to make some change that didn't end up in some kind of annual report or posted on the human rights uh, committee or whatever. And so we really don't have very good data. If every company is being boycotted right now, which they kind of are, um, it's really hard to know who the treatment population is. That feels to me like a, a methodological problem. The second issue is titration, which is how big of a dose of boycott or protest or whatever did you get? In our regressions, it's gonna be a dummy variable, boycott or not, uh, protest or not, but that can't be right. I mean, that would be like say, did you get aspirin or not? One person got baby aspirin and one consumed an entire bottle of it. Uh, and so knowing the dose of the treatment is gonna matter for whether it works or not. This is kind of related to what May was saying about figuring out what is the, um, what are the tactics that work? What is the level of protest that works? Maybe it's got an inverse U relation like every other relationship in the social sciences. And then we know, need to know what's the optimal level of, of obnoxiousness or shareholder proposals uh, or, or whatever. Um, and the last one is the timing. So how long does it take for the treatment to have an effect? In our ideal world, it's next year because that's what Wharton Research Data Services is gonna have data on and that will make us all happy and we can get it published in ASQ. Um, but think about, an, uh, think about how social movements influence corporate behavior. Does it fit into that kind of format? So bringing up Nestle once again, um, if you, you, you may know that Nestle bought Ralston Purina, which makes pet food. Uh, activists told Nestle that the shrimp in Nestle's Fancy Feast uh, seafood flavored cat chow was being caught by slave labor off the coast of Thailand. So once again, Nestle is, oh wait, is this being taped? Once again, an unknown Swiss company uh, is relying on slave labor deep in its supply chains, which feels a little bit unfortunate. At least this time it's, it's adults and not children in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, all right, that doesn't actually make things better. But it took them nine months to figure out whether this was actually true. And then they came clean and said, yep, sure enough, there's slavery in our supply chains. Well, what regression model 
is going to capture that. It's sort of lagged and muffled, and then it takes them 20 more years to actually respond to the protest against um, uh, child labor in Cote d'Ivoire. So it's really hard. We're pretty sure that social movements have some kind of effect, but it's really, really messy. And so that was morose and depressing. I hope this wasn't taped, but this is the kind of study that I myself do all the damn time, just to be super clear. There's nothing I love more in life than fixed effects regressions, um, but it's really hard to answer certain questions that we'd like to. At the same time, it is utterly essential that we do so because we are facing some really crucial threats. The only people standing between us and the breakdown of democracy uh, are social movements, ideally informed by research that can help them out. Excuse me? Yep. Oh, that was random. Hello. Okay. Uh, yep, that's uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to say what happened? If, you're, if you're looking for an interesting dissertation question, um, there's a couple of things. One is that every classic social movement question needs to be revisited in an ICT intermediated world. In a world where everything happens online, even if you're out in the street, in Hong Kong, you're still looking at your phone uh, every two minutes to see what's going on. So all movements are online movements at this point. So one question is how has the repertoire of contention changed? This is a Chuck Tilly term, uh, but it's a pretty good one. And Jennifer Earle and some of her collaborators are doing this work, but it's great. This is rich with possibilities. It's not gonna be regressions exactly, but it's still super interesting. One that I thought was uh, super fun was the SOPA strike, the Stop Online Piracy Act, where a whole bunch of websites, including Google and Wikipedia and dating sites, all went dark on the same day to protest pending legislation in, in, uh, uh, in Congress. And you have to ask, like imagine 1992 Mike Barnett, who was probably three years old at that time, um, that, that there was going to be a website strike by Google. Try explaining that concept to somebody in 1992. It's, it's sort of insane, yet it worked. It actually derailed this legislation. So that's super interesting. What counts as wonk online? Another Chuck Tilly term, worthy, unified, numerous, uh, committed. Um, so the million bot march, I just made that up but it seems plausible. How do you know if a social movement is unified? How do you know if they're numerous if so many accounts are Russian bots? So that feels like a really valuable, how do you convey wonk in a world where nobody leaves their house and they're sort of marching in second life? Um, and what are new methods of framing? Think about Cambridge Analytica and meme wars. Um, we're now in a world where framing isn't just master frame and adapted frame. It could be micro frame that gets you in the morning at the time of day when you're hungry because your breakfast is worn off and you get a micro framing of whatever that issue is. Super interesting. Um, this one I had to throw in because I got so many questions. Uh, is owning the short sellers on Robinhood actually a social movement? I don't think so, but what do I know? Everything is these days. So that seems interesting. Uh, my last point is that this is the part where you shouldn't take a screenshot. Uh, employee activism is the only thing protecting us from incipient corporate fascism. Um, if you think about what's been going on in the world lately, who is, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that Sharon is not enjoying this at all, but um, when workers at tech firms don't want their, their, uh, their enterprise to be doing business with uh, government entities that are imprisoning toddlers on the border and they stop it, that's a big deal. Uh, when Amazon Web Services says we're not working with oil companies anymore because we believe in climate change, uh, that's a big deal. When Twitter and Facebook deplatform an unnamed personage uh, you, you've probably all forgotten about, that's a big deal. And that was employees that were largely behind us. Same with Amazon uh, kicking parlor off uh, Amazon Web Services. So uh, this, is, this is kind of where the rubber is hitting the road right now is in employee activism. Um, they might use some help from objective researchers who know things are, uh, how things work. I'm a scrupulously neutral social scientist. I'm not taking a position for or against incipient corporate fascism. I'm just saying that this is a place where research can make a difference. Whether you're for or against incipient corporate fascism, good research can actually inform practice here. Thanks.
All right. Well, thank you very much. We have a lot to think about, and it's not even clear where to start on the questions, but I'm going to just because Jerry invoked Juan Timothy Michael Patrick Davini, um, I'm going to ask him uh, for the first shot at uh, first, did Jerry live up to the Timothy standard? And then uh, might you have a question uh, to follow up with? Yeah, I think Jerry did a wonderful job. He reestablished the benchmark. Um, yeah, I do have a, a, a quick question, I mean, maybe two part question. Um, one part is that it, it's, it's one thing to look within a society and see um, stakeholder conflict. But the reality is that a lot of the social movements are actually cross border. You know, so it's, it's uh, human rights commissions attempting to, to have an impact on Chinese corporations. It's different groups operating cross borders. And as soon as you do that, you, you bring into um, play societal value conflicts. And, and, and I guess I, I had wrote, written a comment on, in, in the, in the uh, chat where I sort of said, you know, that I was getting this impression that social good movements, good corporations, bad. And how do social movements affect corporations to be more like social movements? Um, and I remember, I don't know if Ted London is on this call, but, you know, that, you know, Ted in a presentation he gave once uh, at an AOM meeting, you know, made this comment that some of the some of the corporate leaders he's met are some of the most socially conscious individuals he's ever seen. And some of the NGO leaders are some of the most uh, mercenary and Machiavellian individuals they've ever seen. So, so I guess the question becomes one of of this 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 issue of trade off. Around well, you know, maybe battling back against social movements generates social good, um, and this idea that you know we're looking at social movement success as somehow a better outcome. Yeah, who who would like to uh, take a crack at that? Basically, just kind of flipping the script there a bit from the kind of in, implicit framing and think about uh, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy here. You know, who's doing the social good. Um, well, I'll just say, say something first and then let uh, other people jump in. But I mean, I think that May did a really good job of pointing out that like there's inherent conflict between groups in society that don't, you know, see, you know, they certainly don't have the same objectives. And, you know, corporations, in as much as their platforms on which um, movements can sort of project their, their grievances and values kind of off, get caught in the middle of that. Um, and so, the, the question about improving uh, improvement, you know, it, it's, it's always in the eyes of the beholder. And typically when we, as scholars, when we analyze a movement outcome, we don't say improvement, we'll say, did they accomplish what, what the activists were, or did the activists accomplish the, the objective they were seeking? Um, yeah, I mean, I think improvement is a more, uh, that can be sort of thought of as a sort of philosophical question. But I, what I would say though, is fr from a movement's perspective, um, they certainly see the outcomes as either improvement, maintaining the status quo or going in the wrong direction, you know, uh, making things worse. And so, um, you know, that's, that's how we're gonna analyze it as scholars. As somebody who believes in movement goals, <laughs> some of the movement's goals, not all of them, obviously, um, you know, I'm going to look around and say, hey, you know, I agree with the environmental uh, movement on certain issues and especially on the big ones, like let's save the planet. Um, and so, you know, are they able to like to do that effectively? And if not, what are the constraints that are in their way? I'll stop with that. And I'll just sort of chime in. I mean, the way that I like to think about this, and it's a really terrific question. So, you know, thanks for bringing it up. Um, I like to think about this in a couple of ways. And, and, and I especially love a quote that Mark Schneiberg and I once put in some, some paper in some really great edited volume. Um, and, and I think that's the only thing that's ever stuck, which is that, you know, when we think about these sorts of effects, they're contested and multi-level. And so I think your question gets at this contestation between you know, what are the parties and what is the conflict? And when we want, to, you know, to think about this, we need to, to the extent that we believe that movements may matter and movements may have their intended effects, we have to, and this maybe should be another call for, for, uh, for research, we must look at the other side of the debate because any kind of movement is likely to have a counter movement or counter stakeholder engagement in, in our sort of parlance. And we need to look at these countervailing effects. So that's, 
you know, the two ways of thinking about it first, the kind of contested uh, piece. But then when I think about the multi-level piece, because part of what you're, I think, talking about is, you know, thinking about um, um, scale shift, for example, any issue that may exist within uh, the United States may shift scales to be brought by, um, you know, other activists or NGOs in another in international context. And we need to think about, you know, the, the, the countervailing and multi-level nature of all of these discussions. So I'll pose another one and I'll just, you know, actually I'm going to give you a menu of choices, right? So what I'm interested in, uh, and you can choose to answer this one is um, as the manager, can you get prescriptive? If you're the, you know, uh, top management of a company, is it better to kind of let all of these things just bounce off of you and ignore them? Um, or you know, because there's a lot of downside and there's a lot of counterposed uh, counter movements as well, or, you know, is it effective to, you know, always be in the middle of this and handle each and every one of these things? Just trying to figure out kind of, you know, where do you step into this as a top manager? And then, uh, so that's one option. Another option is just pick any of the questions that you see on the screen, uh, whichever your favorite is and take a crack at that. The third is just ask something of somebody else on the panel. Uh, I'll leave it open to you. I'll, try, you I'll take the bait on your, your option. So, I, you know, I, I've been um, grappling with this a lot and, and, you know, talking to our exec ed students about social movements and, and why they should matter and how they should process them as executives. And, you know, I think that a, one clear lesson we can derive from the state of social movements and organizations research today is that executives need to stop just thinking about social activism as threatening, right? They, they need to start also thinking of it as, as informative and as a signal of potential opportunities. You know, it is, it is a signal of latent risk, it's how social trends are changing, how cultural appetites are changing, likely regulatory shifts. And so, you know, for all that reason, it, it is not a, it's not a good idea for them to ignore it completely. It's useful information that can help to speak to strategy formulation. Okay, I'll give each of you a chance to uh, either take debate or uh, pick your own or poke at each other. Um, want to do kind of a round robin here? Jerry, as the famed managerialist, don't you have a, 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 an answer to that question? Uh, advice to management? Yeah. Yeah, th this one turns out to be pretty tricky. I mean, I think that that's um, the sense that I get is not inconsistent with what Timothy uh, Davini was saying. Um, that the, that the people at the top might be totally woke um, in their own special way with cool tattoos and piercings and stuff. Um, and then you go one level down and then from one level down all the way to where the work gets done uh, opposite. Uh, and so I think it's often the case that people that lead organizations can be very idealistic, have these ideas. I mean, imagine you come into possession of a company whose main product is selling people uh, bubbly sugar water uh, with, with caffeine in it. And you actually have good ideas about making the world a better place and yet here's this job. There's a limit to what you can do and it's gonna involve some, 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 some trouble with, uh, uh, with, with other employees in the organizations. And so making a change like that can be really complicated. Um, it's like being editor of a journal, you think you're in charge and then you discover <laughs> there's some real limits on changing, you know, what, what goes on within the journal. So, I don't know, it's an, it's an unhelpful answer, but um, yeah, I mean. <laughs> I'll add like one additional thought to this, which is that I'm, I'm in the middle of a, or starting a new project with a student um, who was interested in this question of like, well, one of the questions is when, you know, when do the managers and top, top management teams decide to engage with a particular movement issue, given that, as Jerry pointed out, there are so many right now that are facing any company at any given time, how do they decide which ones to, to deal with? And if you sort of set aside kind of the direct threat, threat uh, problems, like, you know, they're obviously going to deal with those because they're public relations fiascos. The, the answer that we, we seem to be getting is that, you know, they, they care about what their employees think. So their reputation matters um, in part because it shapes their work workplace culture. And so when they believe that an issue is tied to a core uh, employee 
cult, you know, cultural value, they tend to be more eager to act on it. When it's something that's tangential to that, they, they tend to leave it alone unless it you know, rises to the occasion or it becomes a, a you know, sort of a public relations fiasco. I, I would like to, if it's all right, I, I uh, think that the answer to that question was handled um, fairly well by, uh, very well, better than I could have by my colleagues. I immediately went to the place of being a senior associate dean who's in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion right now and thinking about the pressures on us as university leaders to respond to activism and how we have to balance um, the, the very, you know, real and um, often painful claims and questions and calls on us with, um, you know, a, a lot of different stakeholders, including under the former presidential administration, uh, our, our favorite Betsy DeVos, and I'm thinking here about training, you know, so students asking for DEI training at the same time, we are hearing from the former um, presidential administration that it's actually unlawful to do any kind of training that would possibly hint at the word implicit bias. That's just one example. Anyway, I'm going to, I want to go on because there's a question that actually has been asked by somebody twice in the chat. And I wanted to perhaps take a, a, a stab at this. And this is the question about the, about thinking about whether social movements are always directed at corporations or governments or, or those in power. And I think this is a really important question and allow me to, um, to draw very quickly on the broader social movements literature. And in the broader social movements literature, there's often an attempt to sort of talk about, well, well, there's a longer story here, which I won't bore you with, but this sort of pushback on um, this idea that so much of what we know about social movements and their impacts are on government kinds of um, um, powers, if you will. And that's kind of a typical contentious politics sort of view of the world. And some years ago, many of us began to push back on that and say, well, wait a minute, let's talk about the effects of social movements on organizations. And so then you started to see both what we're talking about today in terms of the effects on, on uh, companies, but also a lot of um, research looking at how social movements matter to religious organizations or to broader cultural phenomenon, or thinking about how social movements matter to the biographies of activists. So a lot, and, and, and there's other kinds of outcomes as well. So I think the question that's been asked about this is actually really important for us to think about as um, organizational scholars thinking mostly about the effect on corporations, which is what we've been, you know, focusing on here. And I'll throw out a couple of things just to think about, you know, I, I, uh, if we are just talking about um, uh, corporate targeted social movements, I want to kind of go back to something Braden hinted at too, which is, well, you know, to what extent are um, our social movements directed at corporations really targeting organizational culture or more meso level kinds of phenomenon? And so I think that would be a fruitful area to um, think about or to explore. Um, you might also think about the way in which uh, social movements impact the biographies, and here I'm thinking about employee activists, to what extent, and, and, and you know, play with this idea, to what extent um, is there retaliation against social movement activists within firms? So that's another way to think about an outcome that's in our world here. And certainly there's a lot of evidence, both, both historically and, and currently, that social activism um, within organizations is often met with retaliation by the part of employers as well. So that's a couple of ways to think about that question that that uh, uh, Jesse Burton Nicholson has asked a couple of times. I don't know if others have some thoughts on that as well. Well, to, to build on Sarah's comment, within the social movement uh, research world, uh, which crosses sociology and political science and communications and other other places, we're the weirdos. Like we're <laughs> we're not typical, right? Like we're the ones who study corporations and corporate outcomes. I think most social movement scholars tend to focus on on other domains, including uh, cultural kind of outcomes where they care about movements that are created essentially to create shared identity and um, change people's ways of viewing the world. And so, yeah, we're definitely the, the abnormal ones in that, in that crowd. Well, you, you read my mind there. So, oh, did you have something, Jerry? Go ahead. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to make a suggestion that um, we've got lots of doctoral students and at, at Sarah's place, one of their extremely civilized practices 
is to call on students first to make uh, questions or comments. I really love that tradition, especially in your group. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, Jesse Burton was uh, was one of the questioners, and uh, Nicholas Pajoli is a postdoc, so that's almost a student. But if there's other students, I don't know, put up a funny well, was, hat with your question. And <laughs> I was gonna, you know, I, and I, I saw your post earlier, and that was so I was gonna go to Jesse, and and then I know that Michelle Westerman Bahalo uh, actually uses this as a doctoral seminar. So um, if uh, Michelle, if you have a, a question. Uh, that you're using in a seminar, if you want to uh, ask that. No, or maybe so. We'll, so we'll go to Jesse Burton, you're meantime. first if you want to ask something. So he, he, that was the question. Sarah covered his question. So, oh, you're uh, okay. Yeah. So, well, let's go with Nicholas then. He has several questions. If you want to ask one, Nicholas. Yeah. Thanks. My main question was about approaching this as about improvement. And I think a lot of this has been touched on, uh, but I'm wondering about the, do we tie it to specific stakeholders to determine if it's an improvement or not? Is that a way forward? Do you guys have an answer? Well, I, clarity on I that? think that, I don't know. I, um... I, would, I majored in, in ethical philosophy in undergrad, so I feel like this is the kind of question that I was better suited to answer from that perspective than now. But I feel like it's not that helpful to argue about what large scale improvement would mean. In reality, when we, when we work on a project, we're gonna have a specific question, right? We're gonna be optimizing on a particular performance outcome or metric. And, so, you know, what improvement is, is context dependent, if that makes sense. So, I mean, I think, you know, it would take a larger philosophical approach to try to, to understand whether improvement in the holistic sense is being achieved or even how you would go about defining it. But I don't think that's actually what we do on a paper to paper basis. I don't have a way to tell who else is a uh, student. Um, you guys have a <laughs> Andy Lee says that uh, okay. he is a student at Rutgers, so they're they're actually paying for the electricity. So what? maybe, maybe okay. we should ask him. <laughs> Andy, please bring it on. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, you know, yeah, so I'm Andy. I'm a uh, RBS sophomore, double majoring in finance accounting. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you guys so much for you know just hosting this event. I mean, I think it's really some new tangents for us business school students to look at. So uh, my, my question here, I'm actually gonna read it off. Um, I said like in countries with massive government owned organizations like China, um, would it be a easier to implement change due to their massive you know, corporate influence or would it be more difficult because you know, they might, might not take you know, uh, suggestions if you're not a governmental member? Uh, like how can we trigger international business improvements given this post-pandemic U.S.-Chinese uh, relations and, of course, the new um, administration and how could companies and countries from different and social and cultural ideologies strive to collaborate, uh, you know, for the common good? Sorry, I know that's a lot. Could have worded that much better, but. I love that question. Um, I, I wanted to throw two things out there that, that, that uh, this question inspired for me. Um, one is like the need for comparative cross-national work on what works. We're really good at studying publicly traded US corporations that have data in the Wharton Research Data Services, because <laughs> then you could do fixed effects models more readily. Um, that's not necessarily as informative as it might be. And so you have to imagine that the tactics that work for a family owned business, a state owned business, a public corporation, they're gonna look really different. And the, the repertoire of contention looks really different in say Hong Kong than in Belize in the US or Switzerland. And so, so I think there's a lot of room there for sort of comparative work to get a better answer to that. Um, I also, um, this is just my latest, uh, I have found myself thinking that there may be a benefit in this world for Walmart being so gigantic. Amazon is a tale for another day. But I was thinking like, imagine the dream world of the current anti-monopoly movement. If only we could have mom and pop stores back on every main street, uh, wouldn't that be amazing? Well, their wages were terrible and the working conditions could be pretty problematic and tiny retail. But also suppose you wanted everyone in America to switch to LED light bulbs 
which use far less carbon um, and are a much better way to light up people's house. The only way to do that at scale is to have a company so vast that they can say, we are guaranteeing you orders of this much so that you can make them cheaply enough that everybody can put them into their house. That is Walmart. If Walmart says, let's put solar panels on the roof or let's have, uh, let's push organic food and make that accessible. They're so gigantic that when they do good, they can do it on such a scale that you could never do with lots of mom and pop stores independently deciding to start stocking LED bulbs. So, so I'm gonna, this is embarrassing to admit, I've never set foot in a Walmart, <laughs> even though I write about them all the time. We Catholics call this immaculate conception, apparently. But, um, oh wait, that was offensive, sorry. But, but there's something, inter like big firms, like, uh, if you change what Amazon does, they are the sun around which the planets orbit. If you can get them to change their behaviors, it just has a huge effect. When they say everybody gets $15 an hour, that's like a pretty substantial chunk of the population these days. So, so I think there's something really interesting about targeting the, the giants. So. Yeah, let me, I also, oh, okay, go ahead, Raiden. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I also agree that's a really good question. And I think a lot of the some of the best social movement scholarship over the last 30 years or so has been kind of based in this comparative approach where the idea was, let's understand how movements vary in their strategy and structure, depending on the political opportunity structure of the country that they're a part of, right? So you would look at, you know, you would compare movements in Germany to movements in the Netherlands to movements in the United States. I think unfortunately, because so much of our data comes from the US when we're studying companies or corporate outcomes, our, our, our studies, you have to look around at the, the four of us and we tend to be fairly US centric in, in how we approach this. And so I would definitely push grad students, um, scholars you know, who are forming their research agendas to consider other, other data sources, but also to consider the national kind of political structure as an important moderator or an input to how activists seek to get what they want because it's not, it doesn't work the same way in every country, clearly. Um, there's a lot of good research coming out now on China. And I think that's because um, there's just more and more data available from China. I'll stop there. Yes, great. I was going to make the, the sort of point too about the overall political opportunity structure. And in the paper that I mentioned before about this uh, paper that we did, which was on protest and the effect on firm divestment in Myanmar, one of the big um, you know, findings in there was how strong the political context of the countries, this was a cross-national study, mattered in combination with the protest. We have one minute left, and I like this question that was asked before, and now I can't see it, and so I can't remember who asked it, but it was a question about as, as scholars, how do we feel about being scholar activists, and, and how do we think about that? And I think it's part, part of the reason I find that such a, an interesting and important question is that, um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of say as a as somebody who has always been fairly activist in a lot of different kinds of um, movements and so on. And I don't think I would have come to these topics if I hadn't been an activist and hadn't and don't continue to be an activist in whatever way that I can do that. So I find it very important. But then there is always, of course, the um, way in which we need to remain, um, you know, objective, of course, to what it is that we're studying. But I don't think personally I would have come to these topics had I not been, um, you know, active in social movements myself. And I don't know if the other panelists want to, in our last 30 seconds, uh, comment on that. I'm scrupulously neutral and value free when it comes to my scholarship. So I make no representations one way or another. Maybe you I think it's one interesting thing I found and and kind of being in this research conversation is that the people that study contestation and politics are typically some of the nicest people out there in the field. So I think we are the activists that are also somewhat allergic to direct conflict ourselves. That's, that's a really good point. I, people who know me would say that I'm one of the most conflict averse people in the world. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, like what part of what drew me to this is not that I'm a, like, a, I'm not a great activist just because um, I've never had the, like the time that to do it, I guess. I just had kids really at a really young age. Um, but I was always attracted to the activist point of view. And I was always interested in people who wanted to change the world. And so 
it was it's no surprise I think that a lot of our research tends to kind of look at this from the activist point of view. So when we see improvement, we're asking, are the activists getting what they want? And I think that's maybe the biggest differentiator from like typical kind of uh, uh, either non-market strategy or stakeholder scholars where it was asked the question of how do stakeholders improve the company? Um, so yeah, I think that that is kind of general orientation that affects our, our work. All right, well, I guess time is a social movement as well and we've reached the end of that. So um, this clearly could go on forever, but uh, we, uh, we have to end it here. So first, I just wanna sincerely thank the panelists for uh, some great insights. So thank you very much. Um, many thanks to all of you who participated as well uh, on the session. And a reminder that the materials, including the reading list, slides, video, and chat transcripts will be posted soon. We'll send notice to all registered attendees and you can find links on the RICSI website, which is at business.rutgers.edu slash RICSI, R-I-C-S-I. Please note that I've set up a Twitter account to use for refinements of any research questions. Uh, that Twitter handle is at research underscore better and the title is better management research questions. Uh, another thing to look for is the summer 2022 special issue of Rutgers Business Review. They'll be focused on this seminar series and most of the presenters have agreed to write pieces for it that summarize and extend their debates. In addition, you might be interested in a call for papers for a special issue of Journal of Business Ethics. We've titled it Save Our Cities, Exploring the Intersection of Ethics, Diversity and Inclusion and Social Innovation in Revitalizing Urban Environments. Uh, Ted Baker, Brett Gilbert, Kareen Post, Jeff Robinson and I are the guest editors and initial drafts are due on January 17th, 2022. It'll be here before you know it. Uh, in addition, if you're interested in helping to create the next generation of business faculty, please visit mcnairbusinessscholars.org and sign up to be a mentor. Finally, please do join us for our next session in which we debate the question, can ethics drive firms to do the right thing if there is no business case? Uh, that session will feature all of Rutgers ethicists, uh, Wayne Eastman, Toby Sharding, Joanne Chula, and Daniel Warren. It's on Friday, March 5th, same bat time, same bat place. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Great job, Dre. Thanks. That was good fun.